Where that light is bright. <coughs> okay, we turn to Genesis. Just try what we try with. We got the Genesis twelve. Uh, Genesis two, so Genesis two. It's Genesis 12, sorry, my apologies. The word tonight is our expectation. And uh, there's two sides of expectation. There's one that, in the meaning, gives us confidence, hope, our outlook, our prospect, and our trust. And... We read in the hymn, Blessed Assurance, it gives us that assurance. It also opens our eyes to what's looking forward. That's the, the good, the goodness of expectation. The other side, the opposite, is disbelief, is trust out, impossible, in likelihood. So they're quite profound, really, and they both battle against one another. If we take it up in chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of the country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into the land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee. And make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. So so Abraham was just called out. He left everything. And that was, uh, he done that by faith. And even though he didn't know what the, the, uh, the end was going to be, but he still went, the Lord called him. And if we go to Genesis 22, just keep a thought on that, uh, Genesis 12, because I'll bring it up to Genesis 22. Genesis 22, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee to the land of Mora, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his men with him, and Isaac had son, and played the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. Now remember, he was told to take his son to have a, to an offering. And that's a, that's a real walk of faith, let's say, holding up your son. I just wondered what his expectation was, but he already knew. He already knew the expectation. Uh, verse 4, Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I, the lad, will go yonder and worship and come against you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took, him, took the fire in his hand and the night, and they went both of them together. And Isaac, he, he spoke unto Abraham, his father, and said, My father, he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to a place where God had told them of, and now Abraham built the altar and laid the wooden altar and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him upon the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay him. And we know the rest of the angel stopped him. But you know, in verse 2, he was told to be, he was going to be a father of all nations. So if he would have uh, killed Isaac, 
where would the promise be? So he knew from the beginning what, what God was going to do. But he was prepared to do it anyway. But he showed a great faith. And the, the expectation of Abraham was that he would have the lamb. The lamb would be uh, pulled out of the, uh, the tree or whatever. And uh, But he knew this. I believe he had great faith. And even though he, he held the Isaac's son and put him on the altar and had a knife holding the knife, but he knew the Lord would intervene because of this great faith. And, and because also in, in Genesis 2, you know, he said, I'll make you a father of all nations. And Isaac was his beloved son. So, uh, you know, he was confident, if I can say that. He, was, he had a real confidence in what God can do. And sometimes we may have to do something, not like Isaac, uh, but something beyond their imagination, something out of the ordinary. And we may have that fear of doing it. But be like Abraham, be like uh, uh, Isaac, or be like Abraham, with that great expectation because of the faith that we have by the Holy Spirit. Things will work out for the good. We know this. God will never let us down. The expectation from God is that we do a reasonable service. And uh, the expectation from God is that he will never leave us through by his son. You know. So let's go to uh, Exodus 14. Verse 11. And this is where Moses was going towards the, the Red Sea. And this is the people they mourned. And they said unto Moses, Because there was no graves in Egypt, thou hast taken us the way to die in the wilderness. Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we, we, would, we did tell thee in Egypt? saying, let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians. For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. So it was their disbelief, the opposite to their expectation that God would do a miracle. Of the, the prospect on which they had. And here they are, they thought they were hopelessness. And they, they thought this was going to be the impossible. But Moses was a, he was a man of faith. And uh, verse 13, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. What a great moment that was when everything around them, all the people were just moaning, uh, can, can say that you're gonna, we're all going to die in the wilderness. The Pharaoh's chariots were going to get us, whatever. But Moses never looked at that point. You know, all he said was, fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. So Moses had this great expectation. He had this confidence. He had this hope. He had the, the trust of God. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou to me? Verse 15. Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod and stretch thy hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. It's quite an amazing story. You have one full of faith, full of the expectations of God. He has the confidence of God. He has the trust in God. He has that assurance. And yet the people around him were the disbelief, the doubt, the distrust, the hopelessness. They couldn't see anything. They were blind. And you praise the Lord for 
for this. And that's like us. We have the same ability as Moses. And we remain a part of that sea. <laughs> Uh, but we do have that great faith uh, that, you know, the Bible says, contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And we do that as we walk day by day. Let's go to, let's go to the New Testament, John 6. Uh, that's for, let's take it up in 65, verse 65. He, Jesus was talking about the resurrection here. He was giving them uh, wonderful sayings. And uh, in 65, he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it was given unto him of my father. From that time, many of the disciples went back and walked no more. Then Jesus said unto the twelve, Will you go away? Then Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So, you know, these, I presume they were disciples. This is other disciples. We not only had the 12, but there were also those that followed him. But, uh, you know, they, at one point they believed, and then next minute when he was talking, they lost hope. Because, he, he, you know, he, he talked. And uh, they just did not, they just walked away. And uh, how often have we seen that? We, we give, we've we seen people give a talk and they say, no, no, that can't be true. No, I'll, I'll take my chance. Uh, and they, they become hopeless then, you know, and God still holds held his hands for them. Um, let's go to... First Corinthians 15. Paul was talking to the Corinthians about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 13. And he said, let me take over in verse 20. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we have found false witness of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised up, uh, raised not up. If so, be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ risen. And if Christ be not risen, your faith is vain. Ye, ye are yet in your sins. Then also which, also which are fallen asleep in Christ, are perished. In this life only we have hope in Christ. We are all of men most miserable. So Paul was explaining that if Christ, you know, we believe that Christ is not risen, risen but that their ever every preaching and what they said was all in vain. But and they were dead dead in sin themselves. But uh, 
you know, Paul highlight the danger of believing this. And, uh, you know, the, the great sort of hope that Paul gave them was that people have seen Christ. There's no doubt about that. Uh, Paul had seen Christ. Uh, but praise the Lord, we, we take it up in verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept? For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in all, in, as in all Adam all died, even so in Christ shall be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, Afterwards, they are at Christ at his comings. So what a, a wonderful example Paul gave to the, they were doubting, I suppose, about the resurrection, and he had to put it straight. But the, the expectation that, you know, if you lose sight of the resurrection, then everything in, is in vain. And, uh, but, praise the Lord, they went on. They believed in Christ. And it's like there was um, the Bishop of Durham. He questioned the resurrection of Christ. And this is true. So as a shot of lightning came down in the, the evening time and split the spire of the cathedral. And I just wondered whether that was a warning from God, but it did happen, and the, the, there was headlines all over the paper. Uh, I don't know how far how far back that was, but I still remember it. Uh, you know, is it, when we're young, we have all expectations. Some people want to be an astronaut. Some people want to be a pilot. Others want to do silly things, but. Uh, but that was our life when we were very small. But when we came to Christ, our expectations was that you're given eternal life. What a, what a lovely thought that is. You are given eternal life. You became a son and daughter of the living God. You know, there's many mockers out there, many scorners. But, you know, praise the Lord. Some of them will get saved, some won't. And if we go to, let's see, Proverbs 10. Proverbs 10. Proverbs 10, 24. It says here, the fear of the wicked you shall come upon him. Because the, the wicked have got no expectation, expectation in life. Their thoughts are, do what we can now and go to the grave, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. But it says here, but the righteous is an everlasting foundation. What a wonderful thought that is. And in verse 20, 20 uh, yeah, I think that's it. Probably 24, I think. Not too sure. Go to it. Just sticks in my mind. That's all right. Yeah, verse fifteen. In tw twenty-three. Sorry, twenty-three. It says here. My son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. 
Yea, my reign shall rejoice when my lips speak the right things. Let, the, let not thine heart end thee sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. For surely there is an end, and thine expectation shall not be cut off. Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in thy way. You know, we shall not be cut off. The expectation is we shall not be cut off. We shall live forever, not necessarily, no, not in this body. We can't comprehend uh, the glowing. I, I couldn't. Uh, when you try to explain the spirit, you, you can't really, you can't even, you know, every time you think when you're a young kid, you put a blanket, a white blanket over your head, and you, you sort of frighten the girls. But that's what I did when you sneeze. <laughs> so, but that's not a spirit, is it? You a blanket. But, uh, okay. Let's go to <laughs> let's go to Romans eight. You know, there's Elijah. I think it was, and his servant. They're in a bowl of rubber, bit of problem. The servant was a, they woke up in the morning, they were surrounded by an army. Elijah knew he was all right. But to this man, he, he said, Lord, open the eyes of my servant. And he did. And he seen a company of angels. Uh, you know, sometimes if we look through the natural eye, we don't find an answer. But Elijah didn't rely on the natural eye. He came to God and he said, open the eyes. And haven't we, from the time we were born again, our eyes are being opened. And the expectation that God has given us is this, really, this gift of life. What a wonderful expectation at the, the end of our time, the end of our breath. What a wonderful Crown we shall have. Um, Romans 8. Um, it's 18. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll take it at 15. But we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. But we have received the spirit of adoption where we cry out a father. That's a privilege, isn't it? The spirit itself bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, they're heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which we shall be revealed unto us. For the earnest expectation of the creature awaited for the manifestation of the sons of God. What a wonderful uh, scripture, for I reckon that the suffering this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed unto us. What an expectation we have. What a hope. What an outlook. What a prospect. And... Uh, we grasp it with confidence, don't we? We are confident that every word in this book is true. We trust it. We trust this word with our lives. Because there's many people out there that will try and ridicule us. And, uh, you know, we may not, we don't suffer through blood like they did in the Middle Ages and so forth. But, uh, we do have times when, I think we, and today we call it a bit rough. Uh, people may hammer us and work, keep on at us, pick, peck, and peck away at us. And, uh, but we hold firm, don't we? We have an anchor that uh, holds firm. 
and uh, praise the Lord for that. Um, let me see. It's making me tired. Let's go to. Uh, Revelation 22. Their expectation of our walk is that we make it. That we make it. That our name be written down in the book of life. That's our expectation. And it's a wonderful feeling. It's a, it'll be a wonderful time. And I'm not being morbid, but, you know, when you breathe your last breath and you know you've walked right to the Lord, what a wonderful peaceful end to your life. You know, you, I read some uh, some where he is, when he died, he just said farewell, I think. He just said farewell, so I'm off to receive my crown. And there's many other stories like that where they went off in peace. You know, and uh, praise the Lord, that's what we hope to do, isn't it? You know, uh, Revelation uh, 22, verse 13. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Says in 14, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the tree to the, they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Wow, that, that's a wonderful. Can you imagine walking through the gates? It'd be a wonderful feeling, wouldn't it? You can't comprehend it, can you? Uh, you know, the word says, be a hearer and a doer. And, uh, Praise the Lord for the, uh, the, the call of the, the end. Um, sit down straight. We all have prayer.